Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Duncan Alney here. I am the host of the Firebelly Social Show, where I talk with leading entrepreneurs, CEOs, and founders of mission-driven food and beverage brands. And today's episode is brought to you by Firebelly, where we make brands more likable and profitable through social media marketing. We provide organic, paid influencer and creative service strategies along with the way to get you ROI fast. We were awarded one of the top social media agencies in the world by Clutch. Firebelly's help clients like Netflix, Qdoba, Fiji Water, and many, many, many others transform their social media marketing strategy. So thank you, Firebelly. And if you'd like to know more, go to firebellymarketing.com. But let me say, today's guest, I mean, I'm just so excited. I had like a whole proper introduction, but I'm just going to say, is a very, very uh, old and dear friend of mine, and she's been on every list you can imagine, uh, GQ, The Economist, uh, in every newspaper you can think of, and she's been on Netflix, on Chef's Table, and her first book, Asma's Indian Kitchen, is a bestseller uh, everywhere where people eat Indian food. With no further ado, I want to introduce Asma Khan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Duncan. I'm so excited seeing you. After all these years. After all these years. The last time we met was on the streets of Calcutta. That's right. A lot of great things happened on the streets of Calcutta. Right? Absolutely. Best food. Best food. Everything from food and conversation uh, and and great drinks. So uh, I've got got so many questions for you. Um, Let's first just talk really briefly about the value that Calcutta plays in both our lives, you know, it's th- that's our roots, that's our foundation, you know, uh, that's where we've come from. What was it like, you know, and just really briefly, leaving home and yet bringing it with you? I think that, you know, you really understand the value of Calcutta when you leave it. Because it is so much, you're so immersed in a city which is so frenetic and, you know, all the time, you know, pulsating with activity. But thank God at a time, when there were no mobile phones, there was no, you know, cable television, where friendships and, you know, acknowledging people across the street and conversations were so important. I think that, you know, we are the blessed generation. Today, technology is great because we are where we are because of technology. But growing up in a city like Calcutta, the human relations played a big role. Loyalty and friendship and commitment and the eye for detail and the little things mattered so much. Friendships, you know, that unspoken words, all of that is what has made you and me different. It's sowed in us this thing about equality as well. In that city, you know, you come from a very different background, you know, I come from a very different background when it comes to, you know, our religion, our family background, what our father does. But never ever was that in the equation. I mean, there was a slight complication. Your father was a principal of the school which is the boys' school, not the school I went to, but the school opposite my, my school. But, you know, even then, that even that didn't matter. You know, when I would talk to you, it didn't matter. And this is what Calcutta does. It drapes us around in this kind of, you know, almost a shawl of love. And we are all the same. It evens out all the differences that people might have, the perception of differences. And leaving a place like that and then coming into a city that I didn't know anybody Cambridge was cold and hostile and empty. I came in January where, you know, I, you know, when in Calcutta, you know, no, no tree loses its leaves. If it does, everybody will stand around and stare at it and say, it's sick and it's dying. <laughs> I was so shocked uh, to see trees without leaves. You know, stripped naked, the dry bark, you know. I, rub, I, I remember rubbing my hands down the bark and feeling this was me. I would never have a spring. The tree would never have a spring. In this kind of absolutely biting cold, you know, in my Kolapuri chappas, which are hand-stitched slippers, because I came with the trousseau that my mother had collected over years, never imagining that I would go to, you know, end up in Cambridge in January. You know, my, my slippers matched my silken clothes. I just remember feeling cold and feeling stripped of everything beautiful. And that was what it was, leaving home and leaving Calcutta. It is, it is so interesting. Uh, I can resonate with that. You know, my first stop in the U.S. was outside Detroit. And I remember the coldness and the 
uh, coldness not just in the temperature as you say but also in the in the sort of inherent different way that we connect in Calcutta and the way people connect in other parts of the world especially like very westernized places there isn't that sort of intrinsic i'm going to come knock on your door and say hi just because i was close by you got to call or you got to do this or you got to do that we're going to sit down we're going to have a cup of tea and we're not going to look at our phones right because we didn't have any phones to look at so i think that that connection is so important to us and i feel that that level of authentic connection is something that you have retained and maybe even enhanced over the years where you are able and using social media of course but are able to connect with so many people on an intimate level where you know you're somehow part of the you know so many thousands of people's lives where they feel like your struggles are their struggles you know what's that like and you know are, are there values that you use when you're doing this the thing is that i i realized very early on um uh, and that i had a story to tell but it only would make sense if i kept the story true that it was how i felt and i would be not afraid to admit my weaknesses not afraid to talk about failure and all the doors that were slammed on my face because i think that i didn't you know i never imagined i would be successful that's for sure i never imagined i would have any money that i would earn anything i just desperately wanted to change other people's lives and i know this might sound a little weird but it was this desire to be that friend that i never found when i came to this country i wanted to be that person that people would look at and think there is an asma who has done this i can do it too because you know in the 90s 1991 when i came to this country you didn't see anyone like me on media on television on anything you didn't hear stories of me you didn't hear people accented like me in any position of power or respect so i i felt that you know i am now getting this chance to be that voice and to be that face and in my in my shalwar kameez and my printed cotton this is from calcutta by the way and i want you to see yourself who you were even if now you're not that i want to i want you to see your mother the mother that you were slightly ashamed of and embarrassed of and didn't you know feel that she you know she didn't speak very good english or she didn't fit in this is a second generation asians this is a huge problem this is a schizophrenic existence where they are very british outside the house but when they go in this 1970s pakistan value or silet or you know punjabi you know family which was being put on them the values of 1960s and 70s they haven't progressed that much behind the closed doors so i picked up very soon that there was all this thing that you know i felt very privileged because i was very secure in who i was and this is what i was and this is who i will be and of course you know never imagining that you know my life would be blown apart by netflix and you know being you know everywhere and uh, just 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 from it sorry i'm i'm so sorry i i'm big i I'll, i'll come to you sorry i just had one of my my team coming here uh she just got married but this is the homecoming <laughs> she's got married and she's come to the restaurant that's amazing dressed as a bride that's amazing that's nuri i'll talk to you later i'll talk to you later but this is what it is here this is everyone's home i see i should she hasn't gone back to her own house she's come straight from the registry to here that's in amazing. her full bridal outfit because you know you're not allowed to have a bridal ceremony i couldn't be invited to her wedding she took her mother but she came to me it is very you know but this is what it is you know and she's not indian she's from georgia you know and grew up in spain and she's spanish speaking and she's married a russian uh, husband's russian but there is a universal home people instinctively understand this and this is where the authenticity is you just see this happening here yes where someone feels that you care enough that in her bridal outfit she will turn up sorry i'm in tears i see her like a bride 
<laughs> you know, she's, she's That's wonderful. She started as a waitress. She could barely speak any English, and uh, and uh, yeah, and she's she's looking gorgeous as a bride. But it's uh it's this thing that you know it matters, and emotions matter, and you're not weak if you show people that you can be compassionate. And for me, my greatest, you know, what gives me courage in my moments of weakness or moments of fear, when I think, oh my God, I shouldn't do this. What gives me courage is I know that in my face, people see themselves. Yes. I want them to see that you can overcome fear, that you can overcome the hurdles, that you can rise again. So then I get the courage to push myself further. I mean, it's an, it's an amazing story. Um, I mean, I know I can say personally, you know, I keep, I keep my copy of my book, you know, <laughs> on, I have a beautiful stand. Like it's the only book, the only cookbook that's always in our kitchen, you know? Oh, that's so sweet. Well, I mean, I think it's because it's, it's, you, you know, you have, um, you authentically live and I think people see that. And I, I think that there is a certain mindset of person. It doesn't matter if they're from Georgia and Europe, not in the U.S., or they're from, um, you know, they're a first-generation immigrant living in Indianapolis like me, or if it's someone in Canada or someone in Sri Lanka. I think people can tie into the value of truth and the ability to fight upwards for big things that matter and um, to make a change. I mean, and I think those are, those are powerful values, right? I mean, what would you call that? Is that the, 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 the you know, you're, you're taking food and you're using it for something that's much bigger. You know, it's not about. Yeah. The thing is, it's not food. See, the thing is for me, food is about power. Who eats, who doesn't eat. Food is about politics. Because I, and I've said this to a lot of people here, and the first time I said it, you know, there was it was a quite a big gathering at the time when you could actually have physical people around you, and there was a standing ovation for ten minutes. And I've said it, and I realized they got this. They got this message, you know. And I said, you cannot take my food if you don't take me. You have no right to take my music, to live, wear my fabric, and wear and you know use my architecture and take my paintings. Take away part of me, but do not honor me. If you take away my food, the problem is when you separate food and culture, when you separate culture from anything, it is deeply problematic because that's when there is the split. That's when the honor is lost. You know, I don't care. You can be from any culture. You can be from Mars. You cook my chicken korma and you make my biryani. I will applaud you. You don't need to be of from anywhere, just respect the culture of the food that you're cooking and eat with that respect. That I demand from you, or you don't have the right to eat my food. I will not, the thing is that it's, it's become very easy, you know, where, because enough chefs don't talk about their food and there's no, there's no soul and heart in that, in their brand, then your brand, it's not you. Then this is the problem. This, was, this is what happens. I was never going to separate Darjeeling Express. I was never going to separate the kind of food I make from myself. It's not because I cooked it and it's my hands. You know, my fingerprints are unique. Everything I make has my, has my love and has my time and attention. I can buy back every ingredient in any dish I make. Who will pay for my time? This is the time I gift the person who I'm feeding. Yeah. It's not included in the bill. That is me. I give you part of myself. But I want you to know my story. And your journey, right? Because, I mean, let's face it. I, I know you can amortize things and set prices and look at the market. At the end of the day, people cannot pay for our journey. right? Our journey yeah. is everything we did to get to this point today so that you can feel what I want you to feel. In your case, it's hospitality, it's warmth, it's connection. And it, I think it's eloquently put, it's culture. Like you are essentially making people or giving people the opportunity to be a part of the culture, your family culture, 
And it, that is just something that struck me about the book is it's, it, it is the, the recipes are sort of uh, woven, woven within a fabric of your upbringing and what you hold dear, you know? So I'm like, okay, when I'm going to make the Himalaya chai, I have a certain vibe in my mind. It's going to be a cold day that I'm going to drink it on. And I'm going to like, you know, taste that cardamom. I'm going to taste the peppercorns, you know? And I think that is such a breakthrough, but it's based on courage, uh, truth and keeping it real without any regard really in, in some ways about whether there is approval you're unapologetic I, I I'm, I'm I'm drawn to the story that from a couple of weeks ago where you said um, and I paraphrase I will not see independent restaurants destroyed right yes. because that that is the and I, I'll I'll take it one step further and extend it to small business right it's like yeah. we seem to be on the front lines of this Right. It's like when, whenever there's a challenge economically, it's like the, we have to pay the bills. We yeah. have to the, 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 the toll is the toll is is taken out of our pockets. It isn't the big companies who get like, you know, all kinds of grants and dividends and cash influx. We are the ones that pay the price and you're fighting for that. Yes. And the thing is that, you know, what is really, you know, for me, very shocking is that, you know, last year, early last year, when you know the virus was spreading from Wuhan and had now reached north, you know, northern Italy, there was some absolute, completely abandonment. You know, nobody was going to Chinatown because you know they were hearing things about the the Chinese flu, which was so so racist. But there was a complete conviction, and people didn't go into Chinatown. And I was in Chinatown talking to people. I was campaigning as saying we can't let these small restaurants shut. But what did these people do? These small, the families just brought down the shutters and said, temporarily closed. And they withdrew. They just shut down. Nobody, the great and the good in hospitality only got involved when the big bars and the big boys got closed because of the lockdown. Then everybody was talking about, oh, the landlord should not be getting rent. You know, we need a bailout. We need the government not to take business rates. And I was saying, where were you guys? When Chinatown was a ghost town, where were you when the independents were burning? You didn't come to help us. And it is ironic because I am now, it's a war crime from here, from a grade two listed building in the heart of Covent Garden. You can't imagine what this place looks like. From outside, it is like a palace. From here, it is a war cry for independence. I have got here, I have sowed the seeds with my blood and the blood of my team, which you've got, we raised this whole empire up by our effort. But our roots and our story is that of the closed restaurants in Chinatown. It could have been that. It wasn't that. But I am not going to, you know, sit down now in my palace, in my great two listed central London beautiful restaurant and breathe. How can I breathe when I know people around me are in chains? I can't. So it is really about that, that I need to know that I'm using my platform to, to speak for those who at this moment are unable to speak. It's a, it's a, I, I, I applaud you. It's a, it's, a, it's a meaningful and important fight. I mean, I, I think that it doesn't matter sometimes where you are. Our stories. You know, we, are, we and essentially we'd be fighting the same fight. I think wherever we wherever we would be, it's like the, it's the fight for visibility, it's the fight for yeah. a voice, it's a voice to it's it's a fight to tell people that I don't really you know give a shit about what you think because my story matters, and you've broken the rules. You know, you I mean I I love that you you uh, contextually. I think you uh, you must sit and think. You know, do I care about you know male chef driven culture and all that bullshit? You know, I've taken women who have no um, you know chef training, and I have created world class food that is on everyone's radar. Uh, I mean, yeah. there's, there's a reason that those people are there coming in on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, the thing is that you know, you know, you and I both know this that. In every South Asian, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, whom you go to, it will invariably be a woman cooking. 
But when you go to any restaurant, even in South Asia or in this part of the world, in the West, it's a man cooking. When we were ejected, rejected from power and money and professionalism because we were seen as not good enough. And my, I'm not willing to die till I change the narrative. I want women to come to my grave and say she changed my life. I look at her and she left a legacy. So this is why every day is important for me. I get up every day, it's an opportunity, it's a gift. Because I don't know whether I'll see another day. So for me, dawn is a gift and I don't waste that day. Even if I can make a little bit of a difference to someone else, you know, something small, I need to know I did something for someone else. That I opened the door for them, that I gave them courage, I wiped their tears, I made them feel they were worthy of something. And this is why initially I took to social media and started replying to people myself. And I started talking to people. And when I saw posts, when I felt that this person was unhappy, I would message them. I would DM them saying, what's happened to you? You know, why don't you cook this? What's in your fridge? You know, I did literally did that. They'll send me a picture of their fridge, what was inside their fridge. I tell you, why don't you make this and why don't you make that? And they literally make it. And then kill. I just thought, you know, why don't I do this? Because in some ways, you know, I, I cannot reach everyone, but this is a great medium. You know, I use my phone and I can chat to people and they can send me pictures and let me talk to people just like you would. You know, if you and I would go in New Market, 10,000 people will talk to us. Starting off from the guys who, you know, you knew when they were kids and they'll come and tell you how fat and old you're looking now and that you've really aged. You know, this is the thing, you know, in, this is how it is. You know, you go into Nahum's or you, you know, for me, I go into Chambalamba where I go and buy the earrings and the, and the woman checked my ears and said, even your earlobes have become fat. And, you know, this is, this, this is you know, the beauty of it. So, but I recreate a new market in my, through my social media. It's a place where a lot is going on. You pick who you want to have a conversation with. You don't hurt anyone. You don't, you don't say nasty things. You don't want to, ups, you know, so, but I will take on things that irritate me, that I think are wrong. I will post those stories. I will name and shame people who have been misogynists, who've been racist. I will take on cases where people have been clearly Islamophobic. And I'm, this is where I'm, I'm not afraid. There are times when I feel, oh my God, you know, there's going to be a lynching mob after me. But it is really strange. I mean, I might say this and then curse myself on this one. I have never been trolled. Ever. On social media. Ever. So please, for everyone who's, who's listening to this, be fearless. If you worry that people will troll you for your views, they might. I never worried about that. You know, a small thing like, you know, I was the first British chef for Netflix Chef's Table. When the announcement was made, I very, very, I was terrified, I was shaking. I opened my Twitter to see all those posts. Of, oh, she's not very British. What's so British about her, you know? Not one post. Everyone was like, they're dying of pride and finally London has got someone and it's Asma. And the messages, it took me four days to reply to them. And not one person you know, questioned why I was picked over, you know, white male English chef, not one person. And there have been times when I have been critical of a lot of things, you know, of, of male chefs, but also of employment policies in, you know, fine dining restaurants. And there hasn't been this pushback from anyone. And whatever the reason is, I think that when people know that you're driven by passion, that you are courageous, that you have no fear, they will not take you on in this kind of feeble, anonymous trolling kind of way. It's not that people haven't taken me on. I, I have had people who have been critical of me, but you never see this visible anywhere because they've done it in a very kind of sly way behind backs. Yeah. I don't fight. I'm a Rajput, you know, my father's Rajput, you know, we draw the sword. My, this is my ancestral history where I'm from a warrior tribe, you know, 
people die in the battleground, but you die with your sword out and you die openly fighting. You never ever, you know, stab anyone at the back. And I think that people who do play games and try to go around and try and undermine other brands, undermine other people, such a mistake to give out negative energy, even if it is your rival. Don't bother. Be magnanimous, be large hearted, be kind and gracious. These are qualities people will appreciate. They will not appreciate your snipe swipe at you know some difficulty you know your rival is having. Never ever. It's tempting. I'm not an angel. There are times I think, oh yes, he I already was saved, serves him right, but I don't. Right. I don't because I think it's wrong to kind of you know poke someone when they're down. Asma, I wanted to ask you about pivoting. Like you've had to yeah. pivot. You've had to, I mean, you, you've gone to a, an all delivery model, you know, yes. or mostly delivery model. What's that, what's that been like? It has been very difficult. It's been very difficult because it was something that I had no experience with. It was hard to find, ironically, because a combination of COVID and Brexit couldn't get any packaging. You can't get cardboard boxes in London. And it's really hard to find material to which you can pack food. So even takeaway boxes have doubled in price. You're lucky if you get it, the size that you want. So that was the practicalities of it, that we couldn't get any packaging. It was very hard. But then the one thing I did is I decided to um, team up with a group of young men, uh, chefs, who decided to do their own free because they didn't want to be, you know, in, in bed with really kind of exploitative, you know, delivery portals who were taking a huge amount of money, who had, you know, very restrictive hours and were imposing rules on them. So I decided, fine, let me help these guys. They'll help me. And we came up with a partnership. And if people think that, you know, oh, you know, you, you have a very strong female voice. Do you only work with women? My greatest allies are men. My greatest strength are the men I work with, not the women. I partnership with compassionate, you know, kind, intelligent, decent men, because I am not blinkered. I am no better than others. If I accuse others of being prejudiced and blinkered and biased, you know, against someone like me, I'm exactly the same. If I will not work with someone who looks very different from me, how am I different then? I see the quality of the person. And this was what was very important. This has been a really great partnership and it's made something very, very painful. I have to say, I be, every night before we start packing, I'm like nervous and terrified. Of course, we've had our hiccups where people have said, oh, we got the puchka, which is an Indian, you know, Calcutta street food without yeah. the water because we forgot to put the water jar in. You know, we make mistakes in the beginning. We've not been perfect. We have had to apologize and, you know, say sorry to a lot of people where we messed up their orders. But from making lots of mistakes, we're making very few. And in fact, now not any. So we've learned to set up a better system of control and checking. But none of us have done this before. You know, for us, you know, delivery is very different from, you know, table service. And table service is, you know, so much easier in some ways because it's very direct and you can physically see they ordered that. That's not on their table, but it's on another person's table. Whoa, it's the wrong order. You know, you can <laughs> you can sort these things out. So mistakes can be rectified very quickly. Sir, you don't pay for this. I'm so sorry, this one is not free on the house. It's coming next. Problem over in one second. Now, when someone opens their box and says, This is not there, there is some huge numbers of emails. So all of this is quite hard. But I'm very, very, very proud of my team. They've been amazing. They've shown great courage and enthusiasm. And, you know, lots of paper cuts from all of us making boxes, things we've never done in our lives. You know, we've learned now how we can now do labels, we can do stapling. We are very, very good at, you know, getting all of this organized. And yeah, so we, this has kept, you know, my head above the water. It's brought in enough income for me to be able to sustain uh, things till, till we open. It's been very good as well for me to be able to reach out to, uh, people who are not in London. Also people who are living out slightly further away from central London because it's too expensive 
to send it by delivery. By no no cyclist will go that far. Then you to use a cab. Then cabs are very expensive. So we post to them. So you know zones outside zone five and six in London. We are posting to people. So we are being able to reach out to really residential areas because very few people live around Covent Garden. So we can't do a bike delivery system. Whereas more residential restaurants didn't have this problem. They just got three of the staff bikes and said, "Come on, go deliver this and that." So they had a very easy time. We had a really hard time because when we tried to do delivery, just like pure delivery, no one ordered yeah. because in the three mile radius, no one lives here. Who lives in three miles radius of Covent Garden? No one. Yeah. So and I we. Think, it and was I think depressing. I think your audience is is you know it's a it's a it's a it's it's interesting, right? Because even your audience is a diaspora. It's yes. like, I think there are people that live five miles away. There are people that live, you know, a few hundred miles away. There are people that have, my friend, Michael Hussein, um, he, from Indianapolis, he came to your restaurant and he said that you, the moment you heard I sent him, you were all over, you know, and, and hanging out with them. And you've got, you've got, um, I'm trying to think of the, the, the proper word. It's not disconnected. It's, um, they're, they're, they're geographically removed, but they're part of your, your core audience. You know they're all over. Yes, and so yes. even though you can't reach them, the the, the book, uh, the book gives them a chance, you know, to be a part of your your family. And speaking of which, I wanted to make sure we talked about your new book. Yes. Yeah. Tell uh, Amu, and it's going to yes. be five chapters. Yes. Tell us more. It's five decades of my life. It's five decades of my life. And my mother, who you know very well, whose food you've eaten many times. Yes. Um, was an incredible cook, and she had a catering company. And now when I look back, I think, you know, really radical for that time, you know? Yes. Coming from a royal Muslim traditional family, first entrepreneur in my family. She did it so gracefully and so gently that people hardly noticed that she was running a business. You know, in her silk saris, you know, with her pearls and diamonds, my mother would go around very gracefully attending all these parties, coming back at two in the morning in the temple, you know, with a kind of big truck, with the food. She would come back in that. And none of us, you know, thought this is strange. This is what my mother was, you know. She'd come back in the truck with all the cooks, with all the, you know, big, big, big pots of biryani after the party. She'd stay till the last guest ate. She would not leave. And it was just incredible. When you think now, you know, God, that is just so radical, you know, to do this in a, in, in a city where our family was everywhere. But I think I understood this now from what would be happening with me with social media. If you put the flag down, and you state, this is my position, no one will dislodge you. Because you need to have that inner confidence to know, this is my position, this is my name, this is my brand, and this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And Ammu did that, and I'm very excited because in this book, I go through all the childhood dishes. So I have alu chop and all of these kind of things that you know you and I both grew up eating. And the last chapter is me being Ammu dealing with our second generation boys who are not really into, one of them is not at all into Indian food, but like Aris loves to cook, but he loves to innovate to my great horror. So he does, you know, he does these little twists on things and I'm appalled, you wait till your son starts cooking, you'll know this <laughs> as well. You know, because there's, there's something really kind of, something happens to them and they, they do something to your food. It's delicious, but it's not quite that. <laughs> and you know, and I'm, I've got those recipes there, you know, as well, some of them, which I've had to adapt to, to kind of make them happy. And I also have a whole chapter of, of food of celebration, but food of grief and of parting and, you know, the food that I remember, as, you know, like on my wedding night and then my last night at home and the food that my mother made. So it's all of this as well, very emotional, the food of gatherings, which are now, you know, you ache for it you know, the gathering of, of all, you know, the clan around tables. So, so, I, I, so basically in those five chapters, in the 10 decades of my life, I go through these stages in my life, which is the stages of everyone's life. You don't need to be born in Calcutta. You don't need to be an immigrant. You may still be living in the same house in which you are born. But you have gone through those five stages. You'll recognize them in the book. It's coming to where you and I are both right now. You know, where we have, you know, crossed all those really difficult hurdles. We have had our defeats and we've had our victories. And we have now come to peace 
And now I write the book from a position of peace. I look back with pride, but I also look back with huge amount of nostalgia, but also a need to leave a written record of a city and a person, both. Amu is Calcutta for me in, in some ways as well, because almost all of my years with her, I spent in the city. So just like you will in the book that you have there of me, you know, the reflections of Calcutta, the Anglo-Indian, you know, dishes, the acknowledgement to the Armenians, you know, I, it is going to be a book about my mother, but it's again going to be a, a book about my city and my roots. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I must respond to your, your remark about the Armenian food because the Kima Pulau is definitely like one of my favorites. And it is, it is such, it is an event in a dish. Yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's grand and it's, uh, it's, it's various and it's, it's kind of genre bending. It's, it's just such an amazing dish. You know, let me ask you this question. This, this, this is something I've been meaning to ask you for so long is biryani, right? Yeah. Not the same in different places and yeah. also like very poorly executed, you know, in most places. Like, yeah. What is it about biryani that you think, is what gives it that, like, just the perfect touch, which I know from seeing, from having friends that have eaten your biryani and seeing it online, I know it's there, but why is it so many people fail and you you are able to deliver that true Calcutta biryani punch? I think it's the quantity. Because the problem is that this, the layering, where the meat is at the bottom, the potatoes above the meat, the rice on the top, you need at least this much depth of rice that is dry, that is parched because the steam has been going through it, but all the saffron and the milk has been absorbed. It is, you know, do you remember the, they used to cut it with a plate yes. and then they mix it. That is what makes the biryani perfect. It's the wet rice and the dry rice when they meet. The dry rice sucks all the moisture out of the wet rice and then each grain is perfect. Then eat great. This is the beauty of it. It is a simplicity of that, that absolutely saturated in saffron and spices. The grain meets a dry, dry grain from the top of the pot that has just been absolutely going through heat and has not had any liquid. When you mix it, then you serve it. That is, that is where the magic happens. And if you are making a small quantity and you haven't understood this, that, you know, you look at the top and you say, oh, my God, it's so dry. This is the, it's also about a philosophy of life. You know, all of us need each other. We bring out the best in each other. No one is perfect. For that perfect biryani grain of rice, you have to have two imperfect things to meet. This is that completely dry, completely empty grain of rice with this absolutely saturated rice. This is the secret of a good biryani. Asma, this has been amazing. This has been such a great, I feel like I've been sitting there with you in person. The only thing that was missing for me is, is a samosa. So, <laughs> uh, And Asma, let, let's, let's tell people how can, I, I know one thing I wanted to say, one last thing I wanted to say is that Asma's uh, Indian Kitchen, the book is available everywhere, certainly on Amazon. And I find that if you uh, like this book and you love the food, uh, what I do is I find it uh, I find it's a it's a great way for me to, to give my story, which obviously is, is you know a part of Asma's story and the way we share our values and our connections. I, I give the book, you know, and to me, whether it's a client or whether it's a good friend, it's almost to me like a sign that I have some great hope for our relationship when I give you that book. So. No, and I have people who you've given the book to have written to me. I've chatted to them. They've shown me pictures. And a lot of people wrote to me, this book was, you know, I got this book from Duncan Olney and I was thinking, you know, how many people has Duncan given this book to? They do write to me. It's wonderful. And I'm really grateful. Thank you for pushing up, you know, the, the whole story of Calcutta because that book is really our story. It you is know, our where story. Where you come from, where I come from and all the foods that you grew up eating and yeah. I ate, it's all of that book. Yeah. I mean, I think that, 
you know, if, uh, for those of you listening, if you, if you haven't gotten the book, check the book out or call me and I'll send you the book. But uh, <laughs> Asma, how can people find you? Well, I'm very easy to find. I mean, I, the easiest thing is that you need to go in and just put Asma Khan on Google and you'll find all my socials over there. But it is Darjeeling-Express.com, uh, my website. And I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. And it is, so I think the easiest way to find is through my name. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being here and also for giving so deeply of yourself in this conversation. I know uh, sometimes these conversations, you know, are uh, emotional for us. And so thank you so much. Uh, again, I really have appreciated it. Um, thank you, Duncan. All right. At Firebelly, we make brands more likable and profitable through social media marketing. We provide organic and paid strategies and help you get ROI fast. If you want to establish your brand, expand your reach and get ROI today, let's talk. Go to firebellymarketing.com. This has been an absolute pleasure and we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.